All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, uh, just to get some things, some logistics out of the way, um, this is recorded, so know that, and it will be available um, through a link that someone will send you uh, afterwards. Uh, if you have, we're on kind of a tight turnaround to get the talks in, so um, we'll do one question after each talk, and you can just type in the, in the chat, I have a question, or write out your question there, and the speaker will address it as we're shifting to the next, the next talk, and then there's plenty of room or plenty of time for discussion at the end um, uh, to follow up on questions and think, see how things are linked. So um, without further ado, Jeremy Bassus, you are up. Thanks, Lee. It always takes me a few minutes to um, switch to the screen sharing mode because the buttons on Zoom are really small and I need reading glasses to actually see them these days, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, so I realized that I'm probably already late. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the marine ice cliff instability. And what I really want to point out is the marine ice cliff instability might not be as unstable as maybe we had necessarily been thinking. And as I'm going through, I want you to really keep in mind three things that I'm going to try and convince you of. And the first is really that initiating a marine ice cliff collapse doesn't always result in catastrophic retreat. Um, it can, but it doesn't always result in catastrophic retreat. And more importantly, perhaps, is that the stability is perhaps ultimately controlled more by the ice thickness gradient and the bed slope. And that actually maybe the fingerprint of, of cliff collapse that we could use to project what's going on in Antarctica might already be present in a few thick Greenland glaciers. And so to motivate that a little bit, let's just think a little bit about the marine ice sheet. And the marine ice sheet really is initiated by the fact that the ice thins ductally. And so if you start with a grounding line with thick ice, then because the strain rate, the viscous flow increases with ice thickness, as you initiate a retreat, the ice gets thicker, it flows faster, and that causes the grounding line to retreat faster and further. So what you really have is a system that's driven by the dissipation of grass, uh, gravitational potential energy. The marine ice cliff instability was recently proposed really by um, David Pollard and Rob DeCanto, and it's really based on the idea that tall ice cliffs can't support their own weight. And if you expose a really tall ice cliff, it could collapse. And unlike the marine ice sheet instability, what really have what you have to think about for a marine ice cliff instability is the fact that viscous flow of the ice makes the ice thinner, which means that it's less close to that critical thickness, which means that it's less likely to collapse. So viscous dissipation of gravitational potential energy is actually potentially a stabilizing factor in marine ice cliff instability. And what I really want to talk about in this talk is what happens when you're really close to the critical ice thickness. If you're far above it, then I think all kinds of things are possible. I don't think we understand the materials of property in that stress regime, that the properties of ice in that stress regime that well. If you're far below it, you simply don't break and so you're far away from it. Now, the model I'm gonna use is gonna look at things on kind of weeks to yearly timescales. And it's going to abstract the whole fracture process into an effective rheology. And what I'm showing you here are two figures. One is showing the effective viscosity of ice, and the other is showing the effective stress as a function of strain rate for a given ice temperature. And the way the model I'm going to show you works is it essentially is going to have three regimes. The most important regime that we're typically used to is dislocation creep. That's the power law Glenn's flow rheology that we all know and love. And that's illustrated by the dashed blue line. If you go to really low strain rates, the people might argue that diffusion creep becomes important and fabric and things like that. We don't really need to worry about that because we're interested in larger strain rates. Um, but the distinction between the model that I'm going to show and a lot of previous work is that I'm actually going to allow for the fact that once the ice starts to break, you can't increase the stress indefinitely. So there is a material property called the yield strength. And as you increase strain rate, you eventually approach it. Unlike some other models or approaches where you might abruptly reach that yield strength, the model that I'm going to use has a, a, a continuous transition. So you can imagine that there's a whole bunch of flaws of different sizes that start to become activated as you get higher and higher stress regime. So 
The first simulation I'm going to do is something that's fairly unrealistic, but you can imagine an, a dry cliff and you're going to see about 135 meter thickness to start with um, and no water depth in front of it. And if you play this animation forward, the top panel is going to show you the accumulation of strain on faults. The bottle, bottom is the effective strain rate. You see this initial slump, a block of ice kind of flows out and then you end up with a stable situation with the where the glacier slowly advances again. I'm actually speeding up the movie towards the end because you stop breaking, just end up these little avalanches. And so you end up with this initial break on the lower panel, I'm showing you the change in position and then a slow advance with wobbles around with little bits of ice breaking off. Um, this is initiated with a positive surface slope or increasing ice this upstream. So you are, once you initially break, exposing thicker ice. Um, and so you might expect the marine ice cliff instability to take shape in that case. So top is showing three panels. You'll notice that we break, the angle is about 50 degrees, which is pretty comparable to what they measure in Equipped Sermiac, which is a roughly 100 meter tall cliff that's grounded about 10 or 20 meters of water. Um, you get compression from the debris, and then you're in a stable position, and so you simply advance. Um, the bottom animation is showing that we get pretty much the exact same thing if we use a much more sophisticated um, brittle fracture resolving model that's based on the more Coulomb envelope. Next case is going to get, take us a little bit closer to Greenland. Now we're looking at about 400 meter thick glacier in roughly 290 meters of water. And you'll notice we get kind of that sim same pattern of slumping, only this time we end up with near complete disintegration over about three weeks or so of simulation time. So this is much closer to what people might expect of a marine ice cliff instability in which all of a sudden, once you initiate it, it is self-sustaining. And so the change in terms position just sort of drops off like a cliff to use a pun. And so we see initial slump, the berg detaches and floats away. Now the bergs can actually float away because there's water there. And so the export of ice is actually playing a pretty big role because it's no longer providing a compressive restraining force. And then because the ice is now um, close to buoyancy with that slump calving front, you end up with buoyancy forces that are going to trigger a secondary calving event. So now we get unstable collapse. However, if we add a fairly small amount, 10 to 25 kilopascals of buttressing, we can actually slow that down and even actually prevent it. So we turn buttressing off, on, we started with it on and we turn it off. And this bottom panel is showing in the um, solid line, the original simulation with 25 kilometers, uh, 25 kilopascals of buttressing, you have the same initial behavior and then you stabilize. And then after about day 90, we turn the buttressing off again and then you start to retreat again. So even if you're in an unstable catastrophic retreat simulation or situation, then it's still possible that very small stresses associated perhaps with melange and buttressing, sea ice, fast ice could stabilize the glacier and at least slow down catastrophic retreat, which is largely what people have been arguing for a while. Next case is going to be much thicker glacier, about 800 meters in 700 meters of water, 25 meters height above buoyancy. And you'll notice that we get kind of this slump from the top of the glacier, kind of like what we had before. And then that triggers a secondary buoyant calving event. We don't actually see catastrophic disintegration. We see slow retreat, which is the solid um, brown line on the bottom. And again, adding 25 kilopascals of buttressing actually not only stops arrest, it results in advance as the glacier kind of slowly thins and advances. Um, and unlike the other situations, what we get in this case is interestingly a cycle of calving front retreat and um, cycles of, of buoyant calving. So we get initial slump, buoyancy forces trigger the next calving event as you remove that block of ice on top. And then what happens is that is stable for a long time as viscous flow and slow erosion from the top of the cliff in these kind of little avalanches, Serac failure is what we're calling it, results in a stable uh, cycle of these buoyant calving events that look a little bit suspiciously like height of a buoyancy calving that people used to talk about a little bit more and that you thin towards buoyancy and then you break off. 
if we zoom in on just the portion of the surface elevation close to the calving front, the next thing which I want to do is compare those profiles with Operation Ice Bridge elevation profiles. And I'm going to show you four examples, two of them from Jakobshaven in the two panels above, and two of them from Helheim, the two panels below. And you'll notice that the slope is pretty similar. That's because we set the surface slope of the simulations to be similar to Jakobshaven and Helheim to be in realistic parameter regime. Uh, but you'll notice that one of the things that our model predicts that you see pretty clearly in the data is this characteristic uplift pattern in which you get uplift of um, a few meters to even tens of meters the calving front with this characteristic depression. And so you can kind of see that in these four simulations showing that even though our model is actually a flat bed, constant surface slope and simply evolving, we are getting largely the same pattern of uplift and it's independent of bed slope. Now, the last thing that I wanna show you is a fairly complicated graph but the question which we were really interested is these simulations are all done for flat beds and constant surface slope that would then evolve. And the next thing that I'm gonna show you is what we did when we swept out the parameter space of the inflow velocity, essentially how much ice is being shoved in from upstream and changing the bed slope or equivalently the thickness gradient. So the thickness gradient is shown on the bottom, the bed slope is shown on the top for a constant surface slope and a negative thickness gradient just means that the ice is getting thicker upstream. And you'll notice that we get this pattern of retreat in advance that doesn't seem to bear any strong correlation to whether the bed is prograde or retrograde. Um, but we do see an abrupt change in the retreat rate to greater than 10 kilometers um, per year at a critical ice thickness gradient. And to test to see if that was actually the ice thickness gradient rather than the bed slope, we did a bunch of other simulations with different surface slopes, but the same thickness gradient. Those are the filled squares. And we get pretty much the same behavior for different surface slopes, so long as the thickness gradient is the same. And so what we see is that what's going on is at a critical thickness gradient for cold ice, at least, then as you start to retreat, you expose thick ice, and the thicker the ice, the more likely you are to break. And so in this case, viscous flow can't stabilize um, the collapse by thinning enough. And at the same time, if you try and advance, you're actually pushing the calving front further out of the water because you're on this retrograde bed slope. And so that is also triggering a, another calving, which then exposes thicker ice. And I will also point out that- I mean, I've got just one more pointing out, okay, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Waits Glacier is also marked there, um, where roughly the thickness gradient and the inflow velocity, and we re predict that it would retreat, although perhaps not catastrophically. And so just to reiterate what I've said, um, what we see is that the marine ice cliff instability appears to be driven by the export of icebergs away from the calving front. Um, buoyancy force are contributing to the stresses, it's stabilized by viscous deformation. Um, but we don't necessarily think that a lot of the glaciers in Antarctica are necessarily prone to the catastrophic type of collapse, although certainly retreat at kilometers per year is nothing to joke about. Awesome, thank you. As we're um, shifting presenters, um, does anybody have a question? There is a question. Um, Matt, do you want to ask your question? You want me to read it? Um, I can ask you quickly. Okay. Uh, have you tried to map out trajectories uh, based on modern or theoretical retreat geometries uh, rather than just like what the modern state is for a place like Waits? I don't think I quite understand what you're asking, but maybe we can chat about it a little bit in the chat. OK. That'd be great. Sorry to, to be on a time line here. Um, but we yeah, we have plenty of time for discussion at the end of the talks as well. Um, all right, uh, next up is Martin Forbes, uh, Breaking Better Rifts in Ice Shelf Models. Oh, okay, thanks for that. Uh, it, it, can, is my screen visible? Yep, yeah, looks great. Okay. Okay, I'll dive right in. Um, so I'll be presenting uh, some work that I've been doing uh, with uh, my supervisor, Christina Holba, and a um, uh, master's student here. So I'm at the University of Otago in uh, New Zealand. 
Um, and uh, uh, also master student Holly Still, uh, who's now a PhD student, who's provided some of the content um, I shop wide uh, uh, models that you'll see in this talk. So there'll be two components to the, to the talk. First, I'll talk about uh, the approach uh, that we've developed for modeling rifts in ice shelves. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into uh, looking at uh, an example of a couple of rifts uh, at the front of the Ross ice shelf uh, using uh, this, this approach. So the, the basic premise of this, this approach is to apply linear elastic pressure mechanics uh, in 2D uh, to uh, simulate rifts uh, on the ice shelf. Um, and uh, the, the, the driving, um, so, so rifts in, in, or cracks in, in linear elastic pressure mechanics, what determines the propagation and uh, direction uh, and propensity is uh, the stress state at the crack tip. So the, the, the whole complexity is in properly resolving the, the, the stress state at, uh, at the crack tip. And we apply kind of industry standard uh, method here, which is um, um, the extended finite element method, which is basically a finite element model with some added degrees of freedom that enable you to account for a discontinuity in the continuum and for asymptotic um, stresses at uh, um, a crack tip. And this is what's uh, often, often used in uh, aeronautical or, or automotive uh, uh, industry. Um, so what are we gonna input uh, into this uh, extended finite element um, model? Uh, so we wanna determine the stresses at the rift tips. So we're gonna use the stress fields uh, um, on, on the ice shelf. And to get at the stress fields, we're using our uh, velocity fields. And the two kind of approaches we've been using to, to, to go from our velocity fields to uh, some uh, stress fields is uh, one is, is to actually use a, 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 a nice flow model and, and, and invert uh, for that velocity field and get nice smooth uh, stress field to use. And, and the other approach is to directly uh, use using some um, uh, a constant rheology uh, and constitutive relationship uh, get at uh, the stress field uh, in, in the ice shelf. And this, this will have some more um, uh, fine scale um, detail, uh, but as well as, as more uh, 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 some leftover artifact and, and, and noise that's in, in the velocity uh, field. Uh, so, so how do we actually link the two together? Well, this, this idea is actually uh, was presented a couple of years ago by Brad Lepofsky um, at, at a SCAR conference. Uh, and so, uh, the premise of the idea is, is just to map these stresses into uh, um, an, an XFEM or, or into a, a, a model that's capable of doing um, crack propagation. And to do that, what we're doing is we're uh, finding the equivalent nodal uh, forces that will give us the same uh, stress field. And that's what enables us to do this mapping of stresses from the ice shelf into uh, um, um, uh, crack propagation uh, model. Um, and so our, our crack propagation model is actually a much smaller subdomain that we're only uh, resolving in the vicinity of, of a rift uh, tip. Okay, so that's that's the basic, the, the, the method. Now we'll have a look at uh, some rifts at the front of the Ross ice shelf. So here we're really in the center towards the calving front of, of the Ross ice shelf. And this is a, a, an image uh, from a Landsat image from uh, 1990. Uh, at, the, at this stage, there are three rifts here, but we'll see as we go through the years. So this is in 1999. The bottom rift is, is, is getting ready to, to calve off a large uh, iceberg. And by 2002, that, that large iceberg has, has calved off. And that leaves us with two rifts here, which are the ones that we're actually gonna uh, model. Um, so this is in 2007, 2014. This, this image here is important because this is actually, we have some velocity fields that come from around this, this period. So this, these are the rifts that I used as my seed rifts. So like as my starting rifts for my um, uh, modeling to, to, to apply the modeling uh, approach. And then we'll compare with uh, the present day geometry, which is uh, here in 2019. So these rifts have propagated out farther since, uh, since 2014. 
Um, okay, so here there's there's still a lot of choices to 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 make about how we apply this this approach. Um, so first, I'd like to explain a little bit what I mean here by uh, far field and uh, near field uh, stresses. So uh, far field by far field we we mean uh, the stress the main glycological stresses that resulted from uh, um, gravity pulling on that uh, on the ice and like the macro scale geometry of the ice shelf. Um, and by near field stresses, we mean uh, perturbations to the stress field that are due to, to, to localized uh, local events. So, so a discontinuity such as a rift or um, uh, heterogeneity in the material properties of, of the ice shelf. And to simulate uh, the far field or um, the near field, because we're interested in whether the far field is enough to describe the geometry of, of, of these rifts or describe the propagation of these rifts. Far field, we've done one case where we're just stretching and we're using the mean stretching that we see in, in this area of the ice shelf. Um, we have an intermediate approach, which is to use a relaxed model. So it has some of that. Uh, uh, near field uh, information, but a lot of that has been smoothed out through a thousand year uh, relaxation of, of the model. And then we have a near and far field, which is the same model, but immediately after inversion. So we, we, we have a, a stress field that's pretty similar to what we see in, in that velocity field uh, that we started with, which is the velocity field from 2013 to 2016. So what does that look like? This first example here is the purely uh, stretching. So using boundary conditions to stretch and have the mean stretch uh, uh, that we see in this part of the ice shelf. And this is after 10 steps. So usually I, I flip through a lot more, uh, but uh, time uh, is being limited here. So I'm skipping by 10 here. So this is what it looks like after 20 steps. And then after 30 steps, we have, we have this configuration here. We'll do a comparison of all three uh, uh, to conclude. Uh, so this is the, the, the far field that's been uh, uh, from the model that's been relaxed. And uh, so this is after two steps. Uh, the orientation here doesn't mean much, just the way I, 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 I run the, the actual uh, simulation. And uh, so after 20 steps, we get this configuration. After step 30, we have this uh, general configuration here. And then we have the far and near field uh, example. So this is immediately after the inversion. And this is what it looks like after two steps, they all look the same. 10 steps, we get to this configuration. 20 steps, we've reached this. And then at 30 steps, we have this uh, overall um, uh, geometry of the, of the propagating rifts. All right, so to conclude, let's have a look at these three examples uh, on uh, 2019 imagery. Um, so they've been advected down into, in, in, into place. Uh, and there's three quick points that I'd like to make here. So the first is looking at uh, the, the, the far field. The boundary conditions here are coming into play and they really change the stress conditions. So these are the two pink uh, rifts here. Uh, and they really uh, affect the stresses in the upper rift and causing it to dip down. And I think that's pretty typical of a lot of uh, kind of highly parameterized uh, views of rift propagation. It's very hard to get uh, boundary conditions that are actually uh, relevant to, to what's what's happening out in the ice shelf. Um, the the second the cyan uh, rifts are are um, do surprisingly poor, especially in that in, well in, in that bottom rift. Um, and that's um, I think the takeaway there is that very subtle changes in in, in stress fields will will have a large impact uh, on, on the propagation of of these rifts. And then our, our, our best case with the near and far field, uh, we, we really like the way that the overall behavior of this, this rift, there's, there's some work that I need to do to sync, better sync the, the um, velocity field and the actual propagating uh, tip. And I think that will improve the kind of over uh, the size of, of and amplitudes of this, this uh, behavior. Um, but I think the main uh, takeaway here is that in order to uh, model these rifts, you kind of have to account for the effect that these rifts will have on uh, the actual velocity fields that you're using to feed these, uh, these uh, models. Um, yep, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, are there any questions for Martin? I guess, um, like, what is there any specific data that would help resolve um, these the model parameters more is it like strain at the 
that the tip or the velocity field at a higher resolution? Uh, well, this, I think that the temporal resolution would be would would be the the um, the, the best product. I, I would love to have very high detailed strain at at the tips, but uh, if if I could get um, a velocity field that was um, uh, done over a, let's say a number of days that corresponds to a, a a propagation event, that would that would be the ideal inputs to to this kind of model. Interesting. Thank you. All right, so Lauren, I think you're up next. Please report my agenda. Um, so we have a guest, a guest speaker today. Uh, we, had, we had a little scheduling change uh, and Lauren gracefully said that she could step in and talk about some of her recent work. So uh, Lauren Simpkins talking about glacial landforms as archives of grounding line processes and retreat. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you for joining this optional Zoom call. Um, I think it's, I, I'm always grateful when people show up to these optional things. Um, and I think it's nice to, to continue with our uh, WAFE format um, online. So uh, today I'll be talking to you guys about what we can learn from glacial landforms about grounding line processes and retreat. And one thing I want to want to point out early on is that oh I forgot to set my timer I set my timer too Lee um, uh, is that uh, I am referring to a grounding line because it's hard to tell how zony um, these paleo grounding lines are and um, so so that's that's just the terminology I'll use except for of course when I'm talking about a ground, grounding zone wedge. Um, okay, so if we think about um, these uh, deglaciated continental shelves, we're really looking at former subglacial or ice marginal environments. And here's a nice um, snapshot, which we'll talk about um, in the next several minutes um, of the seafloor in the Ross Sea. Um, and you can tell that there's a lot going on here and we'll kind of we'll pick this apart. But one of the reasons I really like looking at deglaciated continental shelves is because we can learn about um, marine-based ice sheets and glacial systems um, to really understand, well, you know, we have these, this process or these processes um, happening and what's the outcome, right? We can say what the outcome is if we look at the paleo record. Um, so we can, we can think about, um, uh, retreat magnitudes, so magnitudes of individual retreat events. We can think about patterns, so how consistent are, are those um, migrations in the grounding line. Um, we can think about rates if we're lucky and have good chronology, which we all hope we have. Um, and we can also just think about what processes are, are acting at grounding lines. And so I'm going to walk you through um, a few themes. The first being uh, formative processes of ice marginal landforms. Um, the second, we'll be looking at uh, channelized drainage at and near grounding lines. And then the third is looking at the consistency or inconsist inconsistency in retreat patterns. Okay, so first, um, uh, because I'm, I'm skimming over a lot, right, and getting to, getting to main observations and, and conclusions from those. I do want to, to share with you guys the sorts of tools of the trade that I and others use. Um, and the way that I use these tools is to extract process-based information um, from deglaciated continental shelves about the subglacial environment and about the ice marginal environment. So here's a really wonderful schematic um, of the acoustic geophysical methods that we use. Um, and what you'll be seeing a lot today um, are the multi-beam swath bathymetry data sets. And um, I also look at sediment cores um, and uh, various types of sediment cores uh, to, to think about um, extracting processes, um, especially in subglacial and ice marginal environments. Um, and now with the help of a graduate student, Ali Lepp, who is giving a talk in a waste session tomorrow, we're also thinking about uh, pore water um, within those sediment cores and pore water at the bottom or water at the bottom of the ocean to, to think about um, uh, meltwater discharge um, from contemporary systems. 
Okay, so let's think about ice marginal landforms. And, and one really important question is how do they form? Um, and so the two, the two end member landforms that, that I'm talking about today are recessional moraines and grounding zone wedges. Um, here are just some examples. So for recessional moraines, they're both terrestrial and marine examples. Um, and for grounding zone wedges, just marine examples. But visually, they're very distinct landforms. And so um, with, with some of my recent work um, with colleagues thinking about, well, why are, why are these distinct landforms? And so one question, uh, one other question we have is, are they really distinct landforms? Um, uh, or are they more on the sort of spectrum of, um, of landform products that mark uh, grounding line processes. Um, and so the way that we chose to go about this is to look at a really large data set of ice marginal landforms, um, over 6,200, I think, I think it's 6,275 um, ice marginal landforms, both uh, recessional moraines and grounding zone wedges that visually we split into these two populations. Um, and here's one really uh, interesting example um, from this 2018 paper uh, where we see this paired suite of laterally continuous grounding zone wedges and recessional moraines. Um, and because uh, you probably don't have time to count these features now, uh, I'll tell you that there are more moraines than there are grounding zone wedges. Um, and so, so really what this is suggesting is that Within a, within a given space, which here represents time, right? The part of the grounding line can behave differently than another part. So, so the part of the grounding line marked by moraines um, is, is retreating uh, uh, at a higher frequency than the part marked by grounding zone wedges. Um, we also notice if we look at the, some of the acoustic profiles that go across these features, um, and think about sediment content in terms of um, cross-sectional area of these individual landforms. The grounding zone wedges have over eight times, on average, over eight times more sediment than the moraines. And so clearly there is there's a sediment control, sediment availability, mobility um, uh, control on, on which landform will be produced. Um, but also that, that implies time, right? So we know just, just based on counting these features, um, that that time is involved. And so really this shows that there are spatial controls um, across a single grounding line that are that are important in dictating landform product. Um, also, we can think about channelized drainage at grounding lines. And this is um, this is an example from the Ross Sea, um, where we can see a big grounding zone wedge that actually um, uh, uh, re-advanced over former uh, smaller ice marginal landforms. Um, and we can see uh, channelization on the top of that grounding zone wedge leading into this embayment, um, as well as, as a, a relic, um, they're both relic, but even more relic, um, uh, uh, expression of channelized drainage. And, and what we see is that progradation of this grounding zone wedge is limited where there is channelized drainage um, at the grounding line. We can also think about, based on the relationship between the, the channel and ice marginal landforms, think about the uh, drainage frequency. And so here we use the largest grounding zone wedge that's bisected by the channel. Um, and we can say that the frequency of drainage um, is on a maximum, depending on sed different sediment fluxes, um, 90 to 500 years. And so if we just skip over in the Rossi to a nearby uh, glacial trough, we see a really different picture of channelized drainage. And you can see that there are sprinkled along the sides here and even across the channel are ice marginal landforms. And so this is something that, that I'm working on writing up now um, to, to really highlight how uh, channelized drainage at grounding lines is, um, or near grounding lines can be quite variable. Um, and different types of drainage can coexist in the same space and time. And uh, what's really interesting about uh, this, what I'm calling a corridor, um, is that the number of channels and the size of the channels increases downstream. Um, and 
drainage capacity also changes. So it, it increases um, in order uh, three orders of magnitude up to some point, uh, and then we lose that water. Right, so this is marking gains and losses of basal water to the channelized system, um, which is really interesting. And um, other evidence that I'm not showing you here is showing this intermingling of channelized drainage with a till aquifer. Um, and uh, uh, now we can think about what these sorts, what these ice marginal uh, features mean for patterns of retreat that can tell us about inconsistency or consistency, um, or you can think of that as the sort of predictability of, of grounding line retreat. And so um, we really see that there are two different styles of retreat. And these are examples from the Ross Beach, um, where we have this irregular inconsistent grounding line retreat that is indicating um, uh, some sort of modulation of, of a forcing that's causing retreat. Right, so you get these longer periods of stability, you get variable um, retreat magnitudes. Then on the other hand, um, we have this uh, regular uh, consistent grounding line retreat uh, that is in this case marked by small recessional moraines um, that's indicating that the system is really not capable of overcoming the forcing that's driving retreat. Um, and then with some work that is uh, in re-review now, um, from 99 glacial systems uh, uh, from continental margins worldwide. Um, we can look at retreat style in terms of consistency. Um, and for a few cases or a handful of cases, um, those that show re-advance and think about uh, where those sorts of retreat styles occur in terms of bed setting or topographic setting. And what we find is that the tendency for inconsistent retreat in trough um, arises from uh, uh, what we think is from spatially variable, spatially and temporally variable lateral confinement. And so we tend to see systems that can overcome their forcing in, in troughs. Whereas on banks, um, we think of these as uh, laterally unconfined and generally shallow areas on the seafloor where uh, basal drag can be pretty important. And um, we often see this predictable, uh, consistent pattern of retreat. And so I'll leave it there. Um, if you have any questions about any of those topics, feel free to contact me. Um, this is all work uh, uh, done at various points in time uh, with colleagues listed here and with various um, funding sources. And I just wanna highlight that Ali um, is giving a talk in session four tomorrow on persistent meltwater drainage and Santi is giving a talk next Friday um, on subglacial bed roughness and continuity. So you can hear more from the UVA uh, cohort um, uh, throughout the next week and a half. Thanks so much, Lauren. If you have a question, if you can type it or in the chat and, or say, yeah, I have a question and uh, ask away. I have a question if no one else has anything. Um, I'm curious about the channel features that are indicating a change or that you mentioned towards the end. Are they indicating a change in subglacial discharge or just a change in degree of channelization? Um, towards the end, I think it's just a change in degree of channelization. Um, we also have evidence from um, sediment cores that that indicates there's just really uh, efficient routing of water to the grounding line, um, even in places where, where you don't have channelization. So the, the subglacial sediments are um, relatively dewatered compared to other locations that are not around this channel. Um, so, so there is some geomorphic evidence to suggest that, but also the sediment cores do. Okay, great, thanks. All right, well, we had scheduled a five minute uh, break right now to stretch your legs, walk around, um, uh, think about how all these talks are connected uh, and some questions for the discussion. So we will reconvene and uh, 
45 after whatever hour your time zone is in um, for two more talks. Um, please don't disappear. We'll, we'll be right back. Refreshed and ready to go again. For the second half of this session, we just have two talks. And I'll just uh, reiterate that if you have any questions while, while we're going along, feel free to just add them to the chat and we'll try to get them in between talks. And if we don't get to them, we'll follow up in the discussion at the end here. So the first of our two talks for the second half is Allison Chartrand from Ohio State University. And she's gonna be talking about uh, sub ice shelf melt channels in West Antarctica. So take it away, Allison. All right, thanks, Matt. And um, thanks everyone for being here. Just to make sure you can see just the slide, right? Okay. Um, so this is my first WASTE conference and I'm excited to share some updates on my dissertation research on the different channel behavior, basal channel behaviors I've observed in ice shelves along the Amundsen coast. So we know that ice shelves are vulnerable to basal melt, and this figure from Sushil Adusamili's recent paper is one of the most recent maps of ice shelf basal melt rates. And you can see that the highest basal melt rates are here in along the Amundsen coast. Um, these ice shelves are also littered with basal channels, and my research aims to investigate how the basal channels may impact ice shelf stability in light of these high basal melt rates. Basal channels, if you're not familiar, locally thin ice shelves along long longitudinal tracks, and they've been associated with ice shelf fracturing, persistent polinias at ice shelf fronts, and even surface rivers, um, which all have the possibility of impacting the buttressing capability of ice shelves. And um, the formation mechanisms, they may be extensions of subglacial outflows. Um, they may be further incised by warm ocean water causing en enhanced melting, or they might be formed from incision by eskers or undulations in the ice shelf and in the glacier or ice stream bed. Um, they may also be formed by the uplift of locally thinned ice along shear margins of ice streams and then onto ice shelves. And in all cases, these tunnel shapes advect onto the ice shelf with flow. And I use RIMA digital elevation models uh, to investigate basal channel change with very high temporal and spatial resolution. And today I'm gonna show um, some details from several basal channels that I've mapped, or I've mapped the surface depressions of these basal channels using BEMs over the past decade on the Dotson and Getz ice shelves. And to help explain how I map the surface depressions, here's a GIF of time-stamped DEMs on the Dotson ice shelf. And for each DEM, I use a local minima algorithm to locate where the surface depression is. And then I can use those coordinates to do cool analyses, uh, such as feature tracking, to see how these channels are migrating relative to ice flow. And if any of you have been to my talks or posters over the past couple of years, you've seen this figure before, which is showing the 2012 and 2016 locations of a surface depression on, of a basal channel on the Getz ice shelf, 2012 in pink, 2016 in black. And here the red arrows are showing the difference between where we expect this channel to go based on ice flow and where it has actually gone based on feature tracking. Um, so these, these red arrows indicate migration relative to ice flow. And we also see a signature of this migration in maps of Lagrangian thinning on the left and basal melt rates on the right you can see um, there's this band of apparent mass gain and mass loss along the channel. Um, but to me, this indicates that we are seeing 
motion of the channel that is not explained by flow shifting the DENs in a Lagrangian frame. So there's actually preferential melting along the western flank of the channel. And um, this channel has also had some changes at the head and at the end. So at the head, we see that the surface depression has extended upstream by about 10 kilometers. And that's coincident with high basal melt rates and thinning rates in that region. And zooming in at the end of the channel, um, it looks like a second basal channel that we've been looking at run uh, connects with the, the basal channel that we've already looked at in the previous slides. Um, they share similar surface heights as well as similar uh, rates of change in thickness and basal melt rates. And so I hypothesize that these, the high melt rates associated with upward incision of the second basal channel may be contributing to the high rate of westward migration um, that we saw at the end of the longer channel as a, as a result of this connection. And moving to the dots and ice shelf, here I'm showing a large scale view of 10 surface depressions of channels that I've mapped with the Rima time series. And each of the different color groups on this map um, represents a single channel. So the darker colors are depressions that were mapped with less recent DEMs from as early as 2010. And the lighter colors are surface depressions that are mapped with more recent DEMs as recent as 2018. Um, and you already see a variety of behaviors. Where the channels are running parallel to flow, we don't see a lot of lateral migration. However, where the, plant, the channels are running more oblique to flow, we do see some movement. And um, I'm working on comparing that motion to the velocity field. And once again, I'm really interested in these seemingly connected channels here in the middle of the ice shelf. Um, and they share similar surface heights, as we saw between the two connected channels on the gets. And they also share similar thicknesses. Um, this is the hydrostatic thickness uh, calculated from inverting the, the surface height. And we're going to take a closer look at these. So here's that GIF again um, of the surface height. And I was somewhat surprised to see that these channels kind of move as a unit between 2011 and 2018, I was kind of expecting some changes in the channel shape, maybe like where they branch or, or merge. Um, but they all seem to be moving as one. So in, that indicates to me that the, the velocity is spatially uniform across this region. However, it looks like to me there is an apparent speed up after 2014. And here again, we're looking at the Lagrangian change maps for this region. And we see this banding again, like we did on the gets, um, which is likely due to that channel motion that we saw and or the use of um, an average velocity map as opposed to annual or higher space temporal resolution velocity maps. And so adding these surface depression locations on top, we see that the earlier surface depressions line up pretty well with the, the blue stripes or mass gain and the newer surface depressions uh, line up better with the mass loss, indicating that these, these channels are moving. Um, but they still seem to be moving as a unit. And it's also worth noting that um, the melt rate and the thinning rate in this area when spatially averaged is negligible, indicating that any melt that's occurring is happening on the um, flanks of the channels and not upwardly and not contributing to upward incision. Um, so some takeaways, we can detect channel change on short time scales with these high resolution DENs. Um, channels may be hydrologically connected and um, we need higher <laughs> or I need higher temporal resolution velocity maps uh, to really tease out what's going on with this channel migration. So thanks. Okay, great. Perfect timing. Um, do we have any questions for Allison while we're switching over? We have a minute or so here. Sure, Allison, really interesting results. Um, this might be out of the purview of what you're looking at, but what do you think the 
time lag is from formation at the base to surface depression? Um, that's a really good question. And the, the gets kind of has some information about that. So I think it's on the order of years um, because I, I didn't show it, but um, when you look at the rate of melting between 2014 and 2016 at the head of the gets, it's about, I think it's like 20 meters per year. Um, but between 2014 and 2016, it's more like 30, 40 meters per year. And that's when you see that really big extension of the channel. Um, so it, it looks like when melt rates increase, the, you see an expression of the surface depression within a couple of years. All right, great. Uh, to keep on our schedule, we'll move on. And the last talk for the session is by Renata Constantino. So Renata, feel free to go ahead and share your screen. Yes. And Renata will be talking about seafloor depth uh, measurements in on the end off the Antarctic Peninsula using aerogravity data. Okay. You see my screen? Yes, we see the entire. Okay, but that's the last one. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Yep, now that that's looks it. great. All right, take okay, it away. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Renata. I am a postdoc at the Le Monde Doherty, and I work with the Polar Geophysics Group. And today I'm going to share with you results from a recently paper accepted to GRL, named it Seafloor Death of George Seek Sound, Antarctic Peninsula from Inversion of Aerogravity Data, which I have worked with my supervisors, Kirsty Robin, also with Dave from our group, and Tom Jordan from BESS. So uh, the George Seek Sound is located on the western on the west coast of the Southern Antarctic Peninsula between Alexander Island and Powerland. It's covered uh, by an ice shelf and it's the bathymetry beneath this ice shelf that we are looking to model here. So to do that, we use uh, gravity data from Operation Ice Bridge and also from IPGC. So here uh, everywhere I have green lines, uh, they represent the, the flights from Operation Ice Bridge and uh, the orange one from IPGC. Uh, along the flights, we have uh, 29 uh, free air gravity profiles. And between these uh, free air uh, gravity profiles, we have these uh, circles here. They represent uh, seismic depths that we have used to constrain our model. We also use CTD depths uh, presented here as blue and yellow diamonds. Uh, where the ice is grounded, we, I have ice velocity in grayscale here. And just for reference, I'm showing the rider, the Conchi, and the ERS glacier. So here is the location of chart six and also the data coverage. And how do we go from the free air to the bathymetry? So to show that in a very quick way, uh, I'm gonna show in the next slide the model of this line from X to X line. So this profile here, which we call the tie line, and also one crossing profile, which is one marked by the red arrow here. Uh, so here, uh, the first one, uh, it's uh, the tie line. This panel here represents the observage, which is the one collected uh, uh, from the, the airborne survey and the calculated that represents the gravity anomaly of my final model. So the first thing we need to do here is to invert the bathymetry for the tie line. And for that, the first thing we do, we fix the seismic data uh, the seismic depth. Uh, so here where we have green uh, dots, uh, these dots here represent uh, depths of, uh, from seismic, which means that after my inversion at those green points, I will have exactly the same depth as the seismic. Uh, so that means that I'm constraining my tie line with the seismic depth. We also need to build a geological model or we need to assign density uh, to the model. Here, the different colors, uh, they represent different densities. And we do, we did that uh, assignment 
by looking at literature uh, data and also by interpretation of our own data. Uh, after doing the inversion for the tie line, I, I do the inversion for the crossing profiles. So as I don't have seismic uh, data crossing uh, the, the crossing profiles, I use the depth of the inverted uh, tie line to constrain my crossing profiles. So here I have a gray line on the tie line and a gray line on the crossing profile. And this exact, is exactly where uh, they cross at each other. So I fix this depth. For this crossing uh, profile, if I come back here, we can see that I chose this one because it's the closest one to a seismic survey. So I could put uh, those profile, those depths on top of my inverted vachimetry just to validate uh, my model. So we can see that uh, the depths uh, obtained by seismic, they are very current with this, the depths obtained by the seismic inversion, oh, sorry, by the gravity inversion, except for this point here in the edge that we believe uh, it's something related to the filtering processes um, and the resolution of the model. So by doing that, I can show it here, the density that distribution that I have assigned to the model before applying the inversion. Uh, here, the first one, the panel A, I have uh, the density from the sea level to two kilometers deep. And the second one from two kilometers deep to 4.2 uh, kilometers deep. Two things that I wanna highlight here. Uh, the first one is that here uh, where we have a light gray previously mapped fault. Uh, we have, um, uh, we, we, we think that this fault might be a little bit offset from here. So uh, we propose it uh, to relocate the position of this previously uh, interpreted fault from here to the gray line to uh, this black dotted uh, line based on the density edges of our density distribution. Uh, the second thing that I want to highlight is that after doing these uh, models, uh, we are proposing here that we probably have a, dense, a denser block here marked in red. We saw these uh, denser blocks all over those profiles uh, and we have set up uh, the edge of the denser block from uh, increase in the, the gravity gradient. Uh, G seems to be offset by G's fault here. Uh, so we believe that this uh, body was placed before the motion of the fault. And after, so after doing uh, this model and applying the inversion for all the profiles, we have here uh, our final uh, grid. So here inside the black rectangle, we have the gridded vachimetry, uh, which I have gridded using all my, my inverted profiles and also all the data that I have as constraining data. So I'm considering here also the seismic depths, CTD depths, and uh, just a, uh, a part here of multi beam data that I have just in the edge of my area. So here, things that I want to highlight, it's this uh, feature here uh, near from this red arrow. So we have a shallow vachimetry um, dividing two deeper basins uh, in this area. And this is even more visible when we look to this water column thickness. Uh, this water column thickness, uh, I have calculated uh, from my vachimetry uh, through the base of the ice that we have interpreted uh, from the radar. And we can see here that the water, it's going from around 800 meters uh, to around uh, 120 meters. So it's thinning a lot, the water column thickness here. Uh, we uh, believe and we propose that these that we are calling in the paper as a constricting ridge is a potential barrier to ocean circulation. Uh, so I think this was uh, the most exciting uh, thing that we have uh, found in this paper. And this constricting ridge is also uh, in front of this 
glacier here. So now we were looking on basal melt rates. We are also looking on uh, radar data and ice thickness changes at uh, mainly at those places and also in different places too. Um, so I think that's it. It's a lot to say in eight minutes. I have much more to say. So if you are interested, that's my email or we can chat now. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Great, Renata. Good Thank you. Stop sharing um, timing as well. So any questions for Renata before we continue? I have a question. Before this survey, was there any evidence for this presence of a constricting ridge? And have you talked with any oceanographers about the implications mm -hmm. of that or um, ocean observations that might support that theory? So there is a paper from 84 uh, and they, from, they, from uh, temperature and salinity data they say in the paper uh, that, so they have uh, data in front of Hobbs pool that it's right in the corner where the, where the sound makes like the curve. And also in the, in the southern end of the sound. And they say that probably, probably there is uh, something changing or a barrier in the circulation between Hobbs pool and the southern end of the sound. So that's what they say. And then we didn't find anything else. And then we found that in the bathymetry. So we believe that the constricting uh, thing that they are mentioning in their paper from 84, it's the same one that we found here from the bathymetry. Yeah, that's and pretty neat. And it's Potter and Perrin, 84. Okay, that's thank you. Welcome. All right, any other questions? All right, well, I think we can uh, proceed to the discussion portion of the afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Um, and I'm going to turn that back over to Lee to kind of guide that. Oh, I see a surprise. Oh, no, no, that's look. great. Okay. <laughs> I'm totally prepared. Um, yeah, I mean, in true waste fashion, uh, we've always had these kind of discussions about. Uh, a certain topic after individual talks, which I think is a really nice way to try to weave um, different themes together. Uh, and so um, I, either you can type your question or you can ask if nobody's kind of jumping up and down to talk over each other, then that will work just fine. Um, I guess I, I'll start it off and um, say that, I guess Lauren, do you, Lauren and Jeremy's and thinking of how those might be connected, is there geomorphic evidence or would there be geomorphic evidence of ice cliff failure? And I'm sorry if this has already been published like a hundred times. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, if you guys remember, there was a big buzz about corrugation bridges a few years ago, maybe, maybe more than a few years ago. Um, and so those are indicating that the calving line has, has merged with the grounding line. And so then, yeah, we're talking about an ice cliff. And, um, and in terms of um, how much ice is breaking off, to get those corrugation ridges, you need quite a bit of ice. The term, the term is an armada of icebergs that hold each other upright and continuously scratch the seafloor. So, that, that is evidence that, that there is an ice cliff. Um, but then that isn't, if my recollection of that is that it's like do, 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 do. It's not, um, it, it's not kind of what Jeremy had shown of a. Of. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I don't know, I don't know what the evidence of that would be unless you have some really interesting and isolated scour marks mm -hmm. on the seafloor. Um, yeah, that's a good question. But what you're talking about, Lee, no, we don't have evidence. We don't have evidence for like small scale yeah. failure. But I would be curious. 
I'm not saying it doesn't exist, so. but I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, can I comment on that? Please. Uh, hi, Lee. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that with regard to corrugation ridges, those also show a tidal amplitude that, that we were able to demonstrate. So that's telling us that the ice cliff is sort of at the buoyancy limits of the tidal range. And uh, so that's, you know, I think indication that that we're dealing with a, you know, something that's uh, very sensitive to tidal forcing, but also the, uh, you know, the the mechanism for that sort of is really one of tidal flexure and breaking off, you know, in response to tidal flexure. So it's happening pretty quickly, as best we can tell. And Jeremy, I wonder if um, the, I think 25 kilopascals has been thrown out for melange or back stress in a few places. It seems awfully high to me, um, but what do I know? Um, I wonder if you, I mean, you did say 10 kilopascals could also provide some of this buttressing. And I wonder if you've played with the timing of that um, because like it's it, it's calving the icebergs. Those are providing the rigid matrix or rigid material to provide more buttressing. So is the um, I don't know. I guess the can you do you, do you need to have buttressing before some of this happens, or can the buttressing come from the icebergs that break off in that particular event? Uh, wow, that, that was a lot of questions. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let, let me try and answer some of them, uh, and then maybe I'll let other people chime in because they I see a number of people here that might have insight into this who actually have thought more about melange. So I guess from my perspective, 25, 10 to 25 kilopascals is actually a pretty small number. So that's roughly speaking the same stress difference you'd get over a one meter tide. Okay, um, so we're talking a pretty, a relatively small number. If you think about the strength of sea ice, it's also significantly less than the strength of sea ice. So you're talking in the range of pressure ridges in sea ice. Um, so if you think about that, then it might not be consistently 25 kilopascals, um, but you can imagine with sea surface slope and tides kind of ramming sea ice in, providing episodic buttressing from that. Um, if you wanna have larger buttressing and even sustained kind of 25 kilopascal, then you need to have some pinning point or some lateral restraint. It's unclear where that would come from in a place like Thwaites, where it doesn't look like there's an awful lot of pinning points to me. And it's pretty wide, so it's hard to figure out how you're going to, you know, essentially roll these marbles down the slope of waste and then get them to form these force chains across a fairly wide embayment. Um, but I think the bigger point is that anything that slows down the export of ice is going to ultimately slow down export of ice and marine ice cliff instability. And if it does it enough episodically, then you can thin enough so that you're closer to the threshold. I don't know if I answered all of your questions. I might have a little bit all over the place. Yeah, no, that was really that's helpful to think of the comparison with sea ice uh, potential back stress. Yeah, I mean, it, it, aside in Greenland is just where I'm thinking of like, you, there are a few glaciers that have a persistent melange with, con, with that constrictions. And then it seems like a lot of glaciers have a short lived melange that doesn't stick around. Um, so that's why I was just kind of thinking of, a, of timing um, being a piece of it, but. Um, yeah, there's another piece of the puzzle that I didn't talk about, and I'm sure that Alex and other people who have worked on this have more insight than I do, which is actually the distribution of thickness of the launch does make a difference in how it's providing force to the calving front. So you can imagine providing all of that force essentially beneath sea level, at which point it has a far less of an effect. Or if you can imagine kind of holding up the top of the calving front, which is really what wants to slump over, it has a much bigger effect.
So as part of this discussion section, I also really want to encourage early career folks to follow up with questions you might have had during the talks or ideas about um, common threads between the various talks. So please don't be shy. Um, if anything comes to mind, speak up. So this isn't an overarching question, but a specific question uh, for Allison. Um, how do you, how are you handling the fact that a lot of these channels are shorter than the length scale, uh, the flexural length scales, um, so they're not necessarily in hydrostatic equilibrium when you're calculating things like melt rates in the channel? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, I have tried to compare um, the hydrostatic thickness with observed thickness where we have um, radar data from IceBridge. And that has shown that especially, well, I've really only done this analysis on the get so far, but um, it's shown that we're out of hydrostatic equilibrium at the head of the channel, especially where there's a lot of active melt and upward incision. Um, and this kind of goes back to, to Lee's question about the, the lag between melt and um, the, the surface depression expression. And um, where we're out of hydrostatic equilibrium, I do expect there to be more of a lag. However, downstream on that large Getz ice, uh, on that large Getz basal channel, um, the radar and the hydrostatic thickness derived from the DEMs more closely matches. So I, I do think it's in hydrostatic equilibrium there. And um, I, I do plan to do these analyses for other channels where we have the, the radar thickness data. And moving forward, I'd like to come up with some sort of correction term for um, hydrostatic or er, for um, a shelf thickness where we expect the channel to be out of equilibrium. So that's in the works. Cool, thanks. I mean, we had a really nice um, kind of split of observations, um, looking at models and models, kind of testing some of the observations. I'm wondering if there are other if there's other guidance of what are the like key missing observations or what um yeah or what are the what do the modelers need or how are we using some of the observations to test some of the models if people have um have insight in, into that Um, I, I, I can't speak for, for the modelers, but I can speak from the observation side that what I would like <laughs> is just more coverage of, of seafloor bathymetry um, in, in places outside of glacial troughs, which we have really targeted. Um, and, and we've targeted those glacial troughs that are associated with pretty big glacial system. Um, and I would just like to see more variability in like glacial set, catchment size, um, uh, sort of time scales of when we think retreat was happening, and um, more variability in bed characteristics, I think will really help um, be able to extract processes and conditions that are critical for um, grounding line um, grounding line stability or instability um, coupled with better chronology. Uh, and also for thinking about subglacial hydrology and what those sorts of footprints of meltwater drainage and paleo subglacial environments, um, what, that, what that is telling us about spatial and temporal variability in the plumbing system. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I want, I mean, Renata, is there a way, 
without the validation data that you have to extend the aero gravity um, measures measurements there it's another kind of missing missing piece or we really need a lot more observations to go along with um, the airborne systems to kind of speak to what Lauren was saying. So if we have gravity, then we can give a way to get uh, the two to three. So even without the validation part of the model, we can find another way to validate or, but we do, I don't know the coverage of the area in terms of a gravity. So but yeah, we really could work with that. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of a specific location, just of the okay. kind of facts that, that, yeah, your your data set has expansive um, spatial coverage, which might fill in some of the knowledge gaps of different systems that, um, yeah, we're, we're as a community, you know, focused on a, a few key glaciers, uh, which is really helps us understand processes there. But, um, you know, as Lauren is saying, it's nice to, understand the, the processes on different types of systems um, for which it's really hard for us to get have data. Um, so some of these combinations of, of uh, yeah, airborne modeling, ground-based. Mm -hmm. I think one theme that stands out to me uh, for all uh, presenters in this session is that uh, we really want the highest resolution data set possible. And I think we're at a, at a point where, um, you know, our various subfields are really trying to think about these more local scale processes that are in conditions that are super important, we think, for, um, for you know, how I shall break, right? For thinking about channelized water at the grounding line um, at, and, numerous other examples, but I think that we're really at a point where um, we've got to narrow in on spatial scale, on a spatial scale to understand a lot of the questions we, we are trying to address. I have a quick comment. Um, so two of the talks, at least two of the talks talked about how they need more temporal uh, uh, resolution in velocity data. And because I also work on ice shelves melt and grounding line retreat and those kind of things, I feel that this is, this is a very important area where I think we should start looking into. For example, this is a comment for Alison and you can reply. Um, most of the basal melt rates that are uh, derived use a steady state assumption. So basically you are, you are assuming that the strain rates have been have not changed. But if you were to have a temporarily resolved strain rate, for example, a strain field which can be, which is which has a higher resolution temporarily, you'd see that probably the thinning rates due to dynamic changes for the heart moving faster would also start contributing to your uh, movement of the channel. So this kind of things I think can be resolved better if we start looking, if we if we get this, uh, if we get some velocity measurements, which we can track from what, from you know very sh shorter time periods, it would help for those regions which are changing faster, which includes what Alison was talking about and weights. So this is one of the obstacles where we have to assume steady state because we don't have anything else or else look at models, which again, they use the velocity as input. So, um, so that's, that's the short comment. So if maybe we start thinking as a community how we can improve the velocity measurements. Uh, before Allison responds, Andrani, what, what um, temporal resolution are you thinking, like month, week? Um, for fast changing uh, places, I would, I would like to see, for example, if we are looking at seasonal evolution. So at least for the summer months, we have a higher special resolution. So, my wish list would be um, three monthly or even less than that, because for some of the regions, the basal melt rate really varies seasonally. 
So there is a spurt of really high basal melt rates and then everything goes back to like freezing conditions. So the movement of these channels, I haven't, I feel like the movement of these channels, if they are somewhat influenced by the strain thinning would happen during those time. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I did look at some of the annual measures velocity data, um, but it has a lot of gaps, unfortunately, and it's still not quite the, the resolution that I'd like. Um, I, I agree with like three monthly because now we have DNs and ISAT2 that resolve things, you know, almost weekly <laughs> in some places. So yeah, and um, I know my research group is working very hard on getting high temporal resolution velocity maps for Greenland. Um, and it would be great if we could start doing that for Antarctica as well. I thought it's live had the, that, but I, maybe not good coverage over Antarctica. They, they may, I haven't looked into that too much. Maybe someone else can speak more to that. They do, they have all the, uh, Landsat and Sentinel pairs in there, um, but it's only when there's light because it's visual imagery that they're using right now. But you could, in theory, do that on infrared as well. Uh, there's nothing really preventing that. It's just coarser resolution. Well, I won't speak for modelers, but um... I will give a slightly different perspective on the observation modeling uh, thing. And you know, we had this exercise a while ago, part of this um, International Thwaites project where they asked all the modelers what they needed and they asked all the observationalists what they thought modelers needed. And the large scale models basically said, I need bed topography. And then the observational people had like this huge list of really interesting things that the ice sheet modelers largely said they didn't know how to use or make use of. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that the big ice sheet models, and Matt can certainly comment on this, are necessarily at a level they can resolve the fundamental processes that a lot of people, myself included, are, are interested in. And so then we, I guess we need to have some way of linking those processes to things that the large scale ice sheet modelers can use. And I do wonder to what extent the um, paleo data and the um, geomorphology helps us and I feel like I need uh, one of those people to kind of explain to me how you go from these bumps in the bed to this elaborate story, because I'm always amazed and very confused on how on how you figure all this stuff out. But I do feel like there's a lot of in constraints, even if they're fairly rough constraints, that we can ultimately use to test models. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, I think I think that's a good point, right? The the paleo data might not be it's, it's not always equivalent to what you would get using contemporary systems, but I think there are ways that we can we can use those paleo observations in the models. Um, and this is actually a, a project that Lee and I and um, one of my students might be on this call that we're trying to work on is really squeezing the paleo record for as much information as possible to constrain, constrain models. And like one example is how do you, how do you get grounding lines to stabilize on a flat bed with no topography? Um, and and those, are the, those are the sorts of questions we can really try to address with um, coupling the modeling and the paleo observations. I have a comment on that, everybody. Um, I think it's important definitely to note that the large scale ice sheet models, you're not gonna get enough coverage on these really, really high resolution scales to be meaningful. But what is meaningful is the relationships between um, the paleo data and what that means for the ice behavior. And so Lauren, I was kind of excited to see the um, your examples of like how lateral confinement affects ice sheet behavior because that's totally something that um, is relevant to a large scale ice sheet model parameterization that um, can affect behavior. So I guess the point is less coverage, more uh, implications.
with these kind of process studies linking, yeah, looking at sensitivity analysis and linking the two, I think is kind of the approach that that the we're taking now, which seems to be uh, the right the right approach. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thus concludes ses session six. Um, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, and if you have questions, um, you know, email particular speakers or um, stay in touch uh, as a community for sure. So a lot of good questions and results being shown. So thank you.